Hello, everybody, and welcome to the 100 Year Real Estate Investor. We are your hosts, Jake and Gino, and this is the show dedicated to long term personal financial engineering. Gino, how's it going? Doing great, Jake. How you doing, brother? Always making it happen. Today's guest spent years interviewing top CEOs, searching for profound moments of clarity in their careers and personal lives. He is now a leading expert on business storytelling and has trained executives at international giants like Google to use storytelling to create strong connection with their clients. So without further ado, Paul Smith, welcome to the show. Hey, Jake, thanks for having me on. I'm, uh, I'm happy to be here. It is our pleasure. Uh, let's uh, let's get to know each other a little bit. Please share with us your background and how you got started in business. Yeah, so I, I got started in business the way most people do. I went you know went off to college and studied economics. And got a, a degree in business and went into the business world. And I spent twenty years or so, a couple of years at Arthur Anderson as a consultant, but most of my career, twenty years, was at uh, the Procter and Gamble company in various levels of leadership and different job functions. And, and fin I started in finance, moved into consumer research after that, but spent uh, seven of those years on our biggest sales teams. But uh, along that way, I just got fascinated with this concept of storytelling. And uh, that kind of frustrated me because nobody taught me that. They didn't teach me that in business school. They didn't teach me that at Anderson. They didn't teach me that at P&G. And so I kind of set out on my own little personal learning journey, interviewing all those, those leaders that you'd mentioned earlier trying to figure out how to do it. And eventually that, uh, you know, I realized if I want to know this that badly, probably other people do as well. And so it stopped being my own little selfish learning journey and became an idea for a book. And so that's what led me to write that first book. And that was over 10 years ago. And, and that led me to a whole different career path. Uh, so the last, the last 10 years, so I left PNG 10 years ago. I've spent the last 10 years researching and writing and teaching people the art and the science of storytelling at work. Paul, you are a pioneer because 10 years ago, very few people were actually talking about it. Now it seems as if there's hundreds of books on storytelling. What made you want to write the book and how did you perceive it as being such an important skill? Yeah, so well, the, both great questions. So so I decided to do it really more as a, a career change for me. I mean, I thought about, I don't know about you guys, but my experience in life is that most people love 10% of their job. You know, it's like, it's why they chose the profession. It's what gets them up in the morning. There's probably 10% that they don't like, like, I don't know, filling out your expense report or office politics or something. But the 80% in the middle, I think most people think it's, it's good. You know, I mean, I wouldn't do it if you didn't pay me, but it, it, it's good stuff. It's not that 10% that I love, you know, but it, it's still good. And I, I thought to myself at one point, probably 15 years ago, gosh, wouldn't it be great if I could just do that 10%? at the top. And, and I, well, I had to figure out, well, what is that for me? And for me, it was the few days a year that I got to either speak at the company annual meeting or teach a new hire training class or teach a group of newly promoted general managers. Essentially, it was being a speaker and trainer. And I thought, well, okay, well, how do I do that full time? How'd you figure that out, first of all? Because I think it's it should be maybe people be like, oh, I just felt a certain way. But I also think self-reflection, figuring this stuff out is hard at times. So if you don't mind, just before you carry on telling us how you figured it out. Yeah, well, well, it was intentional. Like, so I, so I first had the realization that there must be this 10%. There okay. must be this part that I love. So over the next several months, I just, I, I made mental notes to myself. How did today go? No, oh, today was, today was okay. It was in the 80%. Well, how did tomorrow, how did, you know, when tomorrow happened? Well, how did it go? Oh, today was in the bottom 10%. I spent all day on my expense report, you know, whatever. <laughs> but then, then I noticed that top 10% when it would pop up, I was like, man, I love, today was awesome. Oh. Why was today awesome? Oh, it's because I got to. So I, yeah, I, I basically kind of did a personal inventory over the course of months and figured out that's what that 10% at the top in, has in common for me is getting to teach. Essentially, I'm getting to teach grownups was that top 10% for me. And once I'd figured that out, that's when I, you know, well, how do I get to do this full time? And that's when it turned out, well, just no, there is no job at P&G that or many companies where you get to do that full time. It turns out it's only those those guys I noticed that have written some best selling book and then travel around the world talking about that book. I realized, oh, I guess I got to write a book, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and and then I said, okay, well, if I'm if I'm going to write a book about something and I'm going to spend my career teaching it, what would it be? What would be the thing? And that and that was another kind of self inventory assessment process. And I realized the thing that makes me, I think, more effective than I would be otherwise when I'm doing that teaching and training is the stories that I tell. And that's what kind of started that process. So, so was, are you are you a good speaker or a good storyteller or a good teacher? What is it? I, I think being a good storyteller makes you both of those other things. 
And if you're not a good storyteller, you're probably not going to be a good speaker and you're probably not going to be a good teacher. Wow. Mm. So Paul, how did your first speech go? <laughs> well, I mean, you're still here. You didn't die. So I mean, yeah, I, I, I didn't die, but day. I will tell you. You sold some did. books, right? <laughs> yeah, That'd be okay. I, I will tell you my, my first speech was actually very memorable because I cut myself shaving in more ways than I can imagine. Um, I, I literally, it was out in California. It was, so I got on a plane, flew out to California, you know, unpacked my bag, realized I'd left my razor at home, you know, the rookie mistake, right? You, you don't pack properly. So, you know, I went to the front desk and they've always got those little cheap single blade razors that they'll give you, you know, when you forget yours and it was terrible. And I literally, I'd cut myself all over my neck and I'm literally, I'm bleeding all over nervous, my Gino. white shirt. <laughs> yeah, I'm nervous. Yeah. I was scared to death, you know? And, uh, and I'm looking at myself in the mirror with blood all over my neck and shaving cream <laughs> all over my face. And I'm like, this is going to be the first and the last speech you ever give. <laughs> it doesn't matter how good it is. Look at you. You're a mess. There's the storyteller. <laughs> oh somehow I somehow made it through and uh, yeah, the, the rest worked out, but the, the first one was tough to get over. For all the listeners listening, what, why a story? What's the importance of telling story? Yeah. You know, uh, there are dozens of reasons, but I'm just going to give you one because I think it's the most important one. Stories help people make decisions and, and your job as either a leader or a salesperson. And those are the two groups that I speak to the most is leadership groups and sales and marketing groups. Your job as either a, a leader or a sales and marketing person is to help people make decisions, better decisions. You know, they need to decide to, you know, work better or to make the right purchase decision or whatever. And it turns out all the cognitive science in the last 20 or so years tells us this, that human beings don't make the rational, logical decisions that we'd like to think we do. It turns out more often than not, we make emotional decisions in a subconscious processing part of the brain. And then we rationalize that decision a few nanoseconds later in a more conscious thinking part of the brain. So we leave a decision-making process only aware of the logical conscious part of it, but unaware of the emotional subconscious part. Is that where the gut comes in? When people say the gut, your gut's yeah. warning you? It's yeah, what they really mean is the subconscious emotional part of the brain you know, making those decisions it. for you. Yeah, and your, the, your conscious brain is rationalizing it after the fact. Wow, this is fun. And, yeah, and like it turns this. out stories are just uniquely well qualified to help you reach the subconscious emotional processing part of the brain and your facts and figures and logical you know, conversation and direction that you're giving your people just it only reaches the the left side of the brain the, the logical part of the brain so this is influence then is what we're talking about the reason people covet to be good storytellers is, is for influence is that fair to say yeah 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 it, because it's a it's an effect more effective way to influence people okay so staying on that same path then are most people born with it and then natural people just naturally good at it was it due to upbringing or is it through training Good so all, all the above, because so just think of it like any other art form. Storytelling is definitely an art. It's not a science, right? So let's say you wanted to learn to play the piano. Well, first of all, you'd probably get a piano, but would you just put it in your house and start banging on the keys and hope that you made beautiful music? Well, <laughs> no, right? you you'd take piano lessons from somebody who knew how to play the piano, right? Storytelling is no different. Okay. Uh, the problem is many people think that, oh, it's just something you're born with or or you'll never have. And that's just not true. Yes, there are some people who are naturally. There's Beethoven's and then there's me. Right. The rest yeah. of us. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, if you're, if you're just born with it, great. You don't need to take any training classes. Most of us are not born with it. And we need, you know, to read a book, watch some training videos, go to a class, whatever. Or you learn it like any other skill. The, the worst thing you could do is just assume, oh, well, I'm not good at it. So I'll just. I'll never be any good at it. So yeah, but that's that's up. that's not the people listening to this show right now. So we're good. Okay. We don't got to worry about that. <laughs> so um, the the best way to you know so training obviously is one, but you know I'm thinking of like how people learn to do it, like the, through their upbringing. Maybe what we can talk about you know upbringing a little bit. And it, it seems like the the place back in the day would have been sitting around like barefoot at the campfire right. talking or or the yeah. dinner table. So it, mm -hmm. it can be some influence. Uh, based on your your family and your upbringing as well, uh, what what ways can you incorporate you know storytelling practice into your daily life to make it maybe more enjoyable and, and less painful? Yeah, well, the best way is the, the one you mentioned around around the dinner table or you know um, thousands of years ago around the campfire. Um, hey, man, we still have campfires up here with wood. All right, good. come on, yeah. man, and you probably tell great stories around. Right? Yeah, and in fact, I, one of my books is parenting with a story, and it's all about the kind of stories parents tell their kids or should be telling their 
kids at that dinner table or around that campfire. So yes, such as can, what's that elaborate on the stories. Yeah. So the kind of stories parents need to tell their kids are stories to teach their kids character lessons. Mm -hmm. You can't just tell a kid, Hey, you need to be honest and trustworthy and kind and patient. I mean, I suppose you can tell them that, but they won't learn it. You need, and, and you can't even teach them that just by being that way yourself. That definitely helps. What you need to do is tell them stories about people who were kind or patient or trustworthy or honest or whatever, and show the, the good that came from that in the story or people who failed to be those things and did not. And they show the opposite character trait and have to suffer the consequences of not showing, not demonstrating the right kind of character. The so, ant versus the grasshopper, right? I'm not, I'm not sure I'm familiar with that one. You might have to tell me that story. That's a, that's an old fable of one. I think it was one save for the winner and the other didn't. Gino knows it. Gino uh, can probably tell us verbatim. It's Go ahead, Aesop's Gino. fables. That's why Aesop's yeah. fables. That's, they, exactly. they've, trans, they've transcended time. They've been around for thousands of years. There are beautifully characters in there. And you have the wolf and you have all these different yeah. characters. I, that's an excellent. To teach life that. lessons. Yeah. Yes, and and Gino, tell us more about why... the ant versus the grasshopper. This is your chance to, to storytell and he can evaluate you. <laughs> well, well, grasshoppers jump around all summer long having fun you know we got a plenty of time meanwhile the ants are all running around and they're getting ready for the summertime then it turns into fall you know the grasshoppers are still jumping it's a little chilly the ants are like you better get your ass moving bro because you know what winter's <laughs> coming winter comes the ants are all bur all burrowed in they're all ready to go and the grasshopper is not ready and he perishes so to me it's Ooh, almost like a long-termism and it's a it's a hundred year mindset it's responsibility versus just playing i think the ants can still play and have fun but they know that when the hard times come they're prepared so yeah. yes now so imagine a story like that except with real people so you might tell your kids a story about, you know, their uncle Joe or whatever, who did something or, or failed to prepare. <laughs> so it, it's, it's Aesop's fable type stories, but with real people and real mm -hmm. consequences. Uh, mm -hmm. And those are the best stories to help teach your kids the character traits you need them to know. Let's dive into the story itself. You know, how do you start a story? Yeah. So well, step one is to get your audience to want to listen to your story. Um, Excellent. It, I love that. Yeah. And there, uh, well, there's, there's probably a few steps before that. I mean, you, as a storyteller, you, you need to recognize, you know, here's a moment there. I'm, I'm, I need to tell a story. What kind of story do I need to tell? You know, mm -hmm. what's my what's my teaching objective? What's my leadership communication objective with telling the story? But once you've chosen those and decided to tell a story, step one is to get your audience to want to hear your story because you're, you're going to need to talk for the next two or three or four minutes and have them interested in hearing that and investing that much time in you. So step one, I, I call it the hook, right? It's, it's, uh, you know, a answer the question, why should I bother listening to the story? And the best way to do that is just to let them know that if they listen to you for the next three or four minutes, that they're going to learn something that's important to them, not to you, but to them. So if somebody asks you a question, you, you want to answer it by telling a story, you might say something like, yeah, that, that's a great question. I think the best example of that I've ever seen was when and now you're telling a story or somebody comes to you in your office with a problem and you say, yeah, that, uh, that is a tough problem. Let me tell you what I did five years ago when I had your job and I ran into that problem. And then you tell them the story. Those words just let them know, oh, I'm about to, you know, learn about somebody else who was in my position and ran into the same problem. And I'm going to find out what they did. Now notice what they don't know yet. They don't know whether you succeeded or failed at handling that problem. And it doesn't matter because they're going to learn a good lesson either way. They're either going to learn a good way to, to do it or a bad way to avoid trying to handle the problem. Um, and that's why they want to listen to the story because they want to know which, which way it goes and what, what the ending is. But what they do know is enough, which is I'm going to learn a lesson that's important to me in my situation right now. So that's so always you, step one. You wouldn't say once upon a time. <laughs> would, you, would you use that as well, sir? <laughs> no, no. And in fact, it just reminds me, one of the worst things I think you can say to a bunch of adults before you tell them a story is let me tell you a story, <laughs> you know? And I mean, I actually hear people recommending that. And I just think that's horrible advice because that'll work if your audience is a bunch of kindergartners, right? But probably- Man, I thought once upon a time sounded good. So it must be my grade level, Gino. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Here's what most people do, most adults in the workplace do when somebody says, oh, let me tell you a story. Oh, uh, 
Yeah. Okay. We only have a couple of minutes. Like, uh, yeah, I want to check out. Can you just can you just tell us what you, we're busy? Can you just tell us what you need us to know? You just stole mm-hmm. my next five minutes. How do I get out of this? <laughs> now, yeah. So exactly. Exactly. So in fact, the analogy I use is I think telling an adult, "Let me tell you a story," is like telling a five-year-old kid, "It's time to stop playing with your friends outside and come inside and take a bath." Right. In both cases, they have no interest in doing it. But in both cases, once they're in it. They love it and they don't want to get out. Okay. The kid doesn't want to get out of the bath once they get in because they're having fun playing with toys. And the adult, once they're into the story and it's interesting and they, they want to hear more, they're, they're happy to be in it. But if you tell them in advance, this is, I'm going to tell you a story or you're going to have to come in and take a bath. It just, it ruins it. They, they're not interested. So just never tell them you're going to tell them a story. So how do you just get kids to take a bath? Because that'd be valuable content for everybody listening to this. Yeah, episode. yeah. Well, presumably you're bigger than they are, so you could just I make just it happen. Chuck them in. <laughs> <laughs> you Harder pray. with adults. Listen, uh, everyone listening on the show right now, I'm holding up Paul's book, the first one he wrote, Lead with the Story. For all of you entrepreneurs out there looking to raise capital or, or real estate investors, he's written a book, Sell with the Story. So go make sure you check it out, the content. You know, Paul, in this book, in the first one that I read, you talked the story structure. Let's talk about the story structure because now that we've gotten in the story, now that Jake's, you know what, he's not worried about losing the next five minutes of his life. He's actually yeah. engaged and he wants to listen to Paul. Yeah. What should Paul say? How should he, how should he structure the story? Yeah. So I think the, the structure that I used in that first book was a very simple context action result. Mm-hmm. And, and, and by the way, stepping back, the reason you need a structure is because you only have, like I said, two or three, four minutes to tell these stories. You need kind of a tight structure to follow, or you'll end up rambling on and on and on and, and never getting anywhere. And your great four minute story can become a lousy 10 or 15 minute story. So the structure helps you keep it short, but it also makes sure that you include the right things in the story and in the right order, the order that mm-hmm. the human brain is kind of trained to listen to and understand and interpret stories. Now I'll tell you, I'll admit that over the course of the next five or six years after writing that first book, some of the feedback I got from the, from my, my clients is, so this context action result, like, so what exactly goes in the context versus the action versus the result? And so I ended up developing a little bit more detail behind that that's, uh, that I think is easier for people to wrap their minds around because it's, it's just a list of questions. Here are the eight questions your story needs to answer. And so you don't need to know which parts the context and which parts the action and which it's just, here are the eight questions. Answer these questions in this order and a story will emerge. So I'll just give you the eight questions right now. And the first one we already talked about, why should I bother listening to the story? Right? That's the hook. You got to give them a reason to want to listen to your story. But after you've given them a reason, you've earned the right to answer the next five questions. So here they are. Where and when did it take place? Who's the main character and what did they want? What was the problem or opportunity that they ran into? What did they do about it? And how did it turn out in the end? Right now, that should sound like the natural flow of a story because, of course, it is the natural flow of a story. But if you're keeping track, there are two questions left. What did you learn from the story? And what do you think I should go do now? I, the person you're talking to. So the the first question is just to get them to pay attention and want to listen to the story. The next five questions are the story itself. The last two questions are your opportunity to draw a conclusion and make a recommended action, right? So that's where the leader or the salesperson is getting the business result done that they want out of the story. So eight questions, only five of them are telling the story but you need all eight to accomplish your objective. Guys, you know what's interesting? Um, and Paul, you've probably seen these like uh, reels on Instagram and TikTok. They're like 20 to 30 second videos that people do. And some of them are talking about business. I, I think the format for that is is the hook and the action because you got to get them out in like 20 to 30 seconds. They don't even have uh, a result. So it's a, you kind of have a hook and then you know a little bit of context or action there and then that's it. So it's like as as the uh, the communication and the social media speed the world up, it's it's shrinking the uh, the length of these these types of formats. So I don't even know if you can get a story out in, in that amount of time. Oh, you you can. It, it's yeah. harder. I'll admit yeah. you can. Now a lot a lot of these these videos that you're talking about on TikTok, they're they're not business stories. They're not leadership stories. They're not yeah. sales stories. They're just entertainment. There's somebody that's, that's know, doing something that's entertaining, and so you don't need all eight of those. Yeah, you, you only need one. This, you know, which is what happened. <laughs> I, I, Gino I got a see, bucket of ice dumped on him. Exactly. I want to see somebody jump out of a car, jump off a building or do something embarrassing. Like that's all it is. It's only one question. What happened? It's America's um, funniest home videos on steroids for everybody uh, all the time. Exactly. Yeah. But you, you can tell even leadership stories and get all parts of that 
in in a short amount of time. It's just, it's harder. It's harder to write something succinct than it is to write it lengthy. Mm. Um, in fact, I'll give you an example. Um, uh, I think it was, it's probably Ernest Hemingway. He was challenged one time if he could write an entire story in just six words and he did it. And it's amazing. And I'm going to tell, tell you what it is right now. Here's the entire six word story for sale, baby shoes, never worn. Okay. What happened? Baby didn't make it. Exactly. Right? Right? <laughs> Why'd you do this to me, man? Exactly. I mean, everybody knows. I mean, that it's a sad, it's a terribly sad story told in six words. So it's definitely possible. It's just, it's harder. So you need to, um, you need to, was it a that. miscarriage? Presumably. Now you're getting, now, now you're getting into the, you have to ask Ernest Hemingway, but um, <laughs> said, man, I, yeah, just didn't want to, I didn't want to go there today, man. <laughs> Paul, how do you get emotion into the story? How do you, how do you get put color into your story? Yeah. Well, well, there's one way you talk about, uh, you know, babies that didn't make it, I suppose, but no, you don't. Have, so there are lots of emotions. Uh, sadness is only one of them and it's not necessarily the best one for a, a leadership story. So, you know, pride, anxiety, uh, anxious, nervousness, joy, uh, there are all kinds of emotions. Uh, so it doesn't just have to be uh, sad ones, tear jerkers, and there are techniques. So the folks in Hollywood figured out a long time ago, you know, how to accentuate the emotions in situations and, and leaders can use the same one. So dialogue is one of them. It's one of the simplest ones, right? People say what they think and feel. So if, if your story is just a chronological recitation of the events that happened, you're missing out on a, a, a great tool. So your story shouldn't sound like this happened and then this happened and then this happened and then this happened. It should sound like this happened. And so he said this and then this happened and she said that, right? It should include the dialogue and the emotions will come through in that. But there are a couple of other really easy techniques. Um, the, the simplest one is just to name the emotion. Yeah, she was sad. They were angry. He was frustrated. Like that, literally, that's all you have to do. Just name it and the audience will, will get it. A, a bit more interesting one, though, is to, uh, and I, I call that, that one, tell me, and this one, show me. So show me is, it's not to act it out, but it's to describe the physical manifestations of the emotions on the main character. So instead of saying she, uh, she was sad, say she started crying. Well, people cry when they're sad, right? The audience will figure it out. Or instead of saying he was angry, say he started yelling. Well, people yell when they're angry, right? The audience will figure it out. So describe what was happening, um, the, the way they were behaving that will illustrate the emotions to the audience without having to tell them he was angry, she was sad, right? But you can, you can do that one as well. So there are three very simple techniques, dialogue, tell me, and show me. That's how you make it more interesting, you're saying. Well, it's not just that. It it definitely makes it more interesting. But it actually, the the emotion in the story is what, some some people would tell you that it's a, emotion is a defining characteristic of a story. If you don't have any emotional engagement, well, it's not a story. It's just a case study or something. I think that's why my stories are boring. Because I I tell stories and I think I just like bullet them and try to get the the content Mm -hmm. out, but I don't embellish and talk about Gino with his blood dripping off his face. And he was sweating, <laughs> looking for vengeance yeah. upon the intruder inside his home. And he reached for the Glock and he, <laughs> and he cocked it back. And he said to himself, it's do or die, sucker. <laughs> that sounds probably more interesting than Gino shot the guy when he came in. But that's what it I would does, say. Doesn't it? <laughs> you know? Uh, you see what I'm working with Paul over here. Jake's, <laughs> Jake's got an uncle Vinny who gave him some sage advice before he got married. And the way he says the story is just nondescript. And it's, uh, that's what uncle Vinny told me, Jake, you could really embellish that story a little bit. And it, there's Dude, a lot of humor it was, there, it was but the, it was the two of us sitting at the double O on route nine in Poughkeepsie. And, and, and uncle Vinny was really looking bored that day. Cause I didn't tell good stories at the time. So I was searching <laughs> to pull some knowledge out of the old man. So I kicked him in the balls. Right. <laughs> and he said, oh, shit, you little bastard. I don't know. <laughs> And what did Uncle Vinny say to you? What did you ask Uncle Vinny? I asked him, you know, to give me some marriage advice. Said we're getting married. He said, "What's what's the best thing to do?" And he said, "I'm not going to give you marriage advice. I'm going to give you advice on raising your kids because I know you're going to have kids." And he said, "The key is spending time with them to keep them out of jail." That's Mm -hmm. what he said. That's how the story went. I could embellish it more, but I didn't. That's why I suck. (laughs) You know. (laughs) Well, you're going to go back, listen to the podcast again. You're going to go, okay, this is what I need to do. I'll clean it up. I'll clean it up a little bit and take the part of them get kicked in the nuts out. Right? Yeah. There you go. I like that part. (laughs) (laughs) So do I. I can I can visually see that. (laughs) Well, in the book, I I love there's a story 
that when you went to Pact and Gamble and you took over their toilet paper division and you weren't too jazzed about it. I mean, share that story of how you actually end up, you know, figuring out and getting excited about working in the toilet paper division. It was actually a really cool some story money like, during COVID, right? <laughs> well, this was years ago, bro. And it wasn't a commodity like that, but share that with the listeners and maybe they're sitting there going, I don't have a story for this. This is not really exciting. Yeah. So there, there were two or three in there about that. Are you thinking about the, the train ride in Budapest? The, uh, I was thinking about the one where all of a sudden you go to another country and like it's it's we take it for granted here and over in the other country it's yeah that's no no TP no no they they had toilet paper it just wasn't very nice (laughs) right yeah so um I actually went to talk to uh, my I went to (laughs) almost yeah sound yeah felt like it I'm sure (laughs) so uh, I actually told a buddy of mine named Jeff that I'd gotten this new job being the head of research consumer research for our toilet paper business and like you said I wasn't very excited about it and. Because I just felt like, well, that just seems like a pretty banal product. It can't make that much of a difference in people's lives. Mm. Um, and I, I was complaining about this to my buddy, Jeff. And he he said, yeah, you know, I went to to Budapest, Hungary last year. Uh, and uh, uh, and I was, he said, uh, I was there for a week. And I was on my way back on the train to the airport. And I sat next to this woman. And turns out she was from America, but she'd been living in Budapest. And um, and he said, I was telling her about my week, you know, that that." Uh, you know, uh, the, all the people there seemed kind of, I don't know, melancholy or not very friendly or agitated. Or he, you know, he just, he thought the people there were not very nice. And he's, he's explaining this to her and she's like nodding in this knowing way. Like, yeah, she's noticed that about the people there too. And, um, he finishes telling her his story and she's just staring out the window and she says very matter of factly, I think it's the toilet paper. <laughs> <laughs> and she, she was dead serious though. She looked at it and she goes, you know, the toilet paper here is just so crappy, you know, no pun intended. Um, and, uh, and I laughed about it, but then it occurred to me later, you know, she's probably right. I mean, I'm sure there are other things, but, um, if all you had to, to use to wipe your butt with is, you know, like you said, Jake Brillo pad stuff, <laughs> it probably would make you, you know, chafe. That would change your day. And- Irrit- you'd be irritated all the time and you probably wouldn't be very nice to that visiting businessman from America. You'd you know? probably stink too. So <laughs> you might. So anyway, it probably, you know, it, it's not, I, I didn't think that, oh, it's like curing cancer now. This is going to be the most awesome product, but it did make me appreciate the product that I was about to be involved with producing a lot more. Um, and some I of that downy freshness. That. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Paul, if I'm looking to get more training on storytelling, I mean, you've got five books. I want people to, you know, go to your website. Where did you start? Where did you really learn the art of storytelling? And are there any resources out there right now that you would recommend? So I, I started by reading. So I, I read every book I could find on storytelling. And, were they uh, good or no? Uh, th- th- there were some that were good, but honestly, I still didn't know how to do it after that, which is why I had to go to step two for me, which was interviewing all those leaders, right? I still, mm-hmm. I wanted, I, I just, I didn't know how to put it. Into Who's practice. the best storyteller you interviewed? You know, I, I, I'll tell you some of the, the two that surprised me the most. Um, Cause uh, I mean, there are a lot of people that are great storytellers, but uh, Sarah Matthew, who was this uh, CEO of Dun & Bradstreet and uh, John Bryant, who was the CEO of Kellogg's at breakfast cereal. And the reason they both surprised me was because before they were CEO, both of them were the chief financial officer. And before that, both of them yeah. spent their entire career in finance and accounting. Snooze fest. You're like, oh, this is going to suck, right? <laughs> exactly. These are not the kind of people that I expected to tell great stories, but they did. And I'm convinced that that's why they ended up in the CEO chair. Interesting. But, um, any, anyway, uh, yeah. So I, now I've already forgotten your question. Where, where were we? Sorry about that. I was asking about, about, he's talking about Brillo pads and CFOs and oh, stuff. Yeah. No, Gino, just, Gino's looking for the framework, essentially. Like if I'm someone's getting training. started, yeah, yeah. How, where do they yeah, go? Yeah. And then what path should they follow to become a better storyteller? And you were saying the first step is reading and you're, you're kind of. Yeah. Well, that was my that. first step because there, yeah. there wasn't a whole lot more available at, at the time. This was 10, 15 years ago, you know, and so now you just got a lot more options with, you know, there are, there are, like you said, um, at the time, there was only a few people you could go to teach you storytelling. Now there are a lot, uh, and, and that's what I do for a living. And, and there, there are video courses you can take. There are in-person courses you can take. Um, you can do live stuff online, recorded stuff. Um, and there are a lot more books on the topic now than there were back then. So all, all of those are good venues, uh, good, good vehicles to, to learn, but eventually you have to actually try it. <laughs> um, you know, you can't just read books and go to training classes. If that's all you did, and never tried it, you've kind of wasted your time. You got to get out there and 
like Toastmasters? Like what, what, what are you saying? What's a good starting? No, like, I, no, I, uh, I mean, Toastmasters is great for, for speaking skills, but I, I mean, you actually have to tell other people the stories that you're developing and, and that just takes a little bit of courage for some people. They're just not very comfortable with it. And so you're, you're going to have to do that, but Practice don't do and don't that tell until, them you're doing it. Yeah. Yeah. Don't announce. I'm, I'm going to tell you a story and oh, by I'm the way, I'm to tell you a story. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you also, you can't do that until you've either read the books or gone to the training class. Cause if you go practice without knowing what you're doing, you're going to practice bad habits. So start by learning from somebody who knows and that you trust, mm -hmm. whether that's through a book or a training class or, or, or whatever. Um, and then, yeah, you, you, you're going to have to practice. Uh, in fact, I'll, I'll, I'll warn you right now. I, I wrote, um, I, I did a bl blog post and things for, for years. And one of the articles I wrote on storytelling, one of the comments, well, I'll never forget on it, said something to the effect of uh, the worst stories I've ever heard were from people who had just gone to a storytelling class. <laughs> and I thought, first of all, I thought, oh, geez, I hope that wasn't one of my classes. Um, and then the, the second thing I thought was, God, they're probably right though. And the reason I think is, is because people who have just been to a storytelling class want to practice. Robotic. The, Right. Well, well, they're motivated to try. Now I've been to a class. Now I've been taught and I need to do it. So it's like, it's like saying the worst bicycle riding I've ever seen is from people who just learned to ride a bike. Well, of course it is. They just learned, right? They're, they're out there trying to ride a bike, but they suck at it. Okay. It's the same with storytelling. The worst stories you're going to hear are from people who just learned, but they're at least out there on the bike trying. The people who didn't go to the class and who couldn't tell a story if their life depended on it, you're not hearing them tell stories because they don't do it at all. So of course it's the people who just went to a class. At least they're trying. Now I give mm -hmm. them a couple of months of that and they've, now they've learned how and they practice and now they're going to be awesome. Paul, last question from me. If I'm a real estate agent, if I'm an investor, if I'm trying to sell life insurance, Give me some tips on selling with the story and trying to convince the other side to invest in my product or invest in my product and in, in my company or in my deal. Yeah. So, so here's where the sell with a story book would be, will, will be helpful to your audience. Cause what I do, I lay out in there 25 different sales stories that uh, and you probably don't need all of them, but th these are the most common, most effective types of sales stories that people use throughout the entire sales process from the and there's a handful of them in each phase of the process, from the moment you meet a prospect to building rapport with them, to actually making the sales pitch itself, to resolving objections that inevitably come up, to closing the sale, and even to service after the sale to turn your new customer into a loyal customer. So there's a, there's a handful oh, of stories awesome. you might want to tell in each of those phases. So we don't have time to go through them all now, but I'll, I'll, I'll give you one or two just to give you a flavor for it. So one, one I call a problem story. So it's a story about the problem that somebody might have that your product or service is the solution to. So these are not happy ending stories. These are sad ending stories, not sad, but these are stories where you're telling them about a problem somebody had who didn't have life insurance, who didn't have, you know, whatever. And then, yeah, and then grandma died and, and we couldn't even afford to bury her. What I mean, you know, it's just sad. There's no happy ending to it, right? Now, the second type of story is the most common type of sales story because it's a customer success story. And it's the thing that you compare the problem story. Now, now Jake over here, Jake is one of my clients in my life insurance business. And you know, when he died, here's how it, everything. He transpired. owned a ton of real estate, filthy, exactly. stinking <laughs> rich, but exactly. he didn't have a lot of liquidity. Okay. Exactly. Because it was all tied up into the buildings, but then he had this yeah. whole life insurance. And then when he passed away, it created a liquidity event for his family. So not only were they able to retain their real estate, they had the cash in hand as well. Well, we did our job today, folks. We'll see you later. You sound like you, you've, you've told the story before. Exactly. So those are two, so a problem story and a success story, but there's 23 other types of stories that you might want to tell along the way, including, you know, uh, how we're different from our competitors. You know, why you should, because a lot of people do what we do. Why, why should you come to us versus somebody else? So there are specific stories that you'll want to want to be able to tell along the way. I love that because there's also what you're talking about is a customer experience or the customer journey as they're using your product, why to continue to use them, make sure that they're, that they're, you know, becoming raving fans, they're becoming advocates of the brand. So there's, I mean, I, I would buy that book just for those 25 stories, everybody out there. Yeah. yeah. I think, I think what I'm hearing is be the man in the arena. The first story you're going to suck, but mm. step up and be the man in the arena. Was it Teddy Roosevelt? Right. Mm. I like I that. Think so. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, best place for folks to get a hold of you, to get the book, network, and all that good stuff. Yeah, probably my website. Uh, thank you. So it's a leadwithastory.com, which is just the name of my first book. I guess I was never more creative after after that with website <laughs> titles. So <laughs> lead with a story. Leadwithastory.com. Our story is that we believe in buying deals for the long term. We think in decades. I'm Jake. He's Paul. He's the G-Daddy. And we all make it happen. Appreciate your time today. We'll see you next time. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Paul. Thank you.